smaller, larger ears. And we're going to go through each one of these. And of course, we've got the roof rat, or the Norway rat on top, smaller ears, larger animal, a more blunt muzzle. And so you know, there are a lot of different ways to identify, of course. We've talked about the ears and the tail. The point I want to make here is that it's very important in a young rat. A young rat is going to be larger than the house mouse. Uh, so um, we look at paw prints and we look at other uh, features, but it's very important to identify that animal so that we can make um, the appropriate uh, control strategies. So we're going to do some true and false here because there's some urban myths out there. And the first one is urban rats and mice must gnaw on items so that their teeth do not grow uncontrolled. Well, the answer there is false. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is in fact the case. So here's a photograph, but yes, their, road, their teeth grow continuously. Uh, the enamel on the rat's teeth is stronger than copper and aluminum. So it's very, very small. And the rat can actually chew through stain, uh, cannot through chain, cannot chew through stainless steel. But you saw the picture here below. Um, that's an aluminum can that the rats actually got into. Um, no problem. Claudia, can you speak up a little? Some people are having difficulty hearing you. Okay, here we go. Can you hear me now? And everybody just uh, bear with yes, us. Yes, much better. <laughs> so, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bear with us on this. This is our first run. Anyway, but if you look at the... Every system, time you turn your head away, it's when your, your voice goes lower. All right. Sorry about that. So... Um, here we go. So I'm looking at the screen. And so here's a skull of a rodent. And let's look at its teeth. So the enamel is very, very strong. Um, and on the outer part is where the enamel is. And on the inside is where the dentin is. So if you look at the way the teeth come together, the lower incisor is going to hit the bottom, the dentin part of the upper incisor. And so that is naturally going to cause that tooth to wear away. So very important. So when we're thinking about pest proofing and closing out holes uh, for these animals so they don't enter your home, you need to make sure we're using very tough uh, materials, such as stainless steel, um, you know, and other products that are, they're not going to be able to chew through. All right, so here's another urban myth. Um, true or false, can rodents squeeze, rodents can squeeze through holes because they don't have any bones, only cartilage. Well, that is in fact false. You know, these are things that we hear about all the time. It's false. And so, yes, they are able to squeeze through tiny little holes. Here's a rat, a mouse. And it, uh, this one is actually going through this small gap underneath to simulate under a door. Um, but they're really able to flatten out their skeleton. They're made out of bones. As long as they can get their skull through that hole, the rest of the body is going to move through. So these are skulls, again, of a, of a rat and of a mouse. And the rule that we use is a number two pencil and a 35 cents. So if you can move, if you can place that pencil underneath that door, well, that mouse is going to squeeze through. And that is the same for a rat. So for example, if you've got a, a hole larger than a quarter, that rat skull can push through. And if you have a hole large, larger than a dime, that skull of that mouse is going to push through. So when you're thinking about pest proofing around your home, these are awfully small uh, holes. So rodents really use the sense of touch um, in their, the way they uh, behave and how they communicate and understand their environment. So their whiskers are called vibrissae. These are very well developed and highly sensitive whiskers. And so there are nerves at the base of each of these vibrissae. And just imagine as um, a rat or a mouse is moving through, those vibrissae are extending out and they are touching the environment uh, in which they are in. So they're using those vibrissae to stretch and understand and touch and feel the environment around them. They do move independently. And so sense of touch is very important. Here's a painting from John James Audubon from 1852. And of course, he was well known for painting uh, animals in its uh, size and also in extreme detail. So here are some pictures or paintings of rats. And let's focus in on this particular rat. And it's an excellent depiction of all of the guard hairs that are on the, out, on the um, outer part of the animal, on the fur. 
And of course, you can see the vibrissi as well. So sense of touch is very, very important. Um, and we just, we've talked just about, about this already, but those guard hairs and the vibrissi are gonna orient, orient that rodent in the environment. A lot of sensory uh, because of the nerves at the base of those uh, hairs, those whiskers. Um, and when these animals are running along a wall or through grass, it's really going to give them a lot of information about their environment. These animals are able also to um, utilize memory, uh, muscle memory. Um, so let's say there's a source of water or food um, on a particular path to, their, to where they're living and where their colony is headquartered, their, their borough or wherever it may be. Um, so they're able to pre-program. And so when we're thinking about doing control, these are places that we're gonna look at, such as runs, uh, which you're gonna uh, look at here in a few minutes. And those are places where we would be putting control devices. Rodents also have a very keen sense of hearing. Um, they can also hear ultrasound. So that's 20,000 hertz or higher. And so rodent hearing is from 200 to 80,000 hertz. Um, and this is another question that comes up quite a bit. Uh, ultrasonic devices have not been proven to be an effective rodent control or prevention strategy. So um, we, they, we're not aware of any uh, data that supports that information, or the use of those devices. So I think, you know, what is really interesting, and in, in these are mammals, so these are co highly complex organisms. And so rats and mice um, emit vocalizations when they're stressed. And um, infant rats can also emit distress calls. They have also determined that female uh, laboratory mice are able to produce pheromones, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, and they can cause male mice to vocalize, even really to sing. So communication using pheromones is extremely important. So what are pheromones? They're chemical substances produced and released into the environment by a particular animal. Um, it could be a mammal. Dr. Yes. Try to keep the mic steady because people are saying it's going in and out. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. okay. All right. So we're going to have to figure that out. I'm sorry about that, guys. And so um, it's very important um, in communication either in mammals or in insects, and they're going to affect the behavior or the physiology of their own species. Here's an example. Um, this is a really fantastic video of a rat urinating. And actually, there are a lot of pheromones that are in that rat urine. So we're gonna watch that one more time because it is incredibly fantastic video. And what that animal is doing is very specific. And it is leaving a signal and sense for other members of its group saying, perhaps there's food here or don't visit this area. Right? Okay, so our number one house pest is going to be, mammal pest here is going to be the house mouse, right? It's the number one rodent pest across the world. Its origin is found in Central Asia, very likely transported on ships uh, with merchants and, and people moving through. Um, and it is very widespread. Uh, other than people, they're number one on the planet with mammals. Um, as far as identification, they're relatively small, about 15 to 30 grams. So what we did was, um, see those crayons? There was what, seven or eight, nine crayons? That's about the weight of a house mouse. So they're pretty small, very fluffy, uh, but the body itself is, is small. Large ears, um, they have that semi-naked tail, and the, it's as long as the head of the body, the head and the body together. Never use the fur um, to speciate, because there you can see in this particular photograph quite a bit of variety uh, in the coloration. So females produce about four to seven pups a litter. Uh, the gestation period is only 19 days, so very quick. Um, but of course, the pups are born helpless, blind, uh, but they're able to open their eyes in about seven to 10 days, and they're weaned in about three to four weeks, so pretty quick. And it's not much after that, five to eight weeks, and they're already sexually mature, ready to produce uh, babies themselves. 
So these animals in the wild live around six months to a year. It's very difficult. There are a lot of disease, uh, predation um, that cut the life uh, short of these animals. The behavior can vary quite a bit. In cities, let's say you're in a, an apartment building or, um, or even a house, a large home, these animals can spend their entire lifetime within that property. But in our suburban, in our rural areas, we do see that they live outdoors as well as indoors, and they will go from in to out as well. They're omnivores, so they feed on wild seeds and insects, slugs. Um, so you really need to look at what um, you know, you're leaving out around your house. And in buildings, they will nest in voids, in walls, in furniture as well. So make sure that you're always checking. So at this time, we're going to convert over um, the PowerPoint to Mr. Uh, Timmy Bybear, and he's going to go ahead and, and talk to you about the Norway rat. Okay, let's see. Does this mic work better? Uh, Stacy? just give me a heads up before I start talking. You're good, Timmy. Okay, cool. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, jump right into the Norway rat. Uh, I love this picture because pictures are great when dealing with rodents and uh, pictures are great in general, but this one tells a real story when you look at it. Uh, something should draw your attention immediately just besides the fact that that's a really beautiful picture of a Norway rat. Uh, there's daylight behind it. Uh, this is definitely a typical behavior for Norway rats. Uh, we'll get into that a bit more in a minute, but it, it's telling you so much as this rat shouldn't be out there during the day. Something's wrong. Uh, it could be a number of factors playing into it. But beyond that, too, when we look at it, we see those beautiful vibrancy, the little tiny ears. We don't get a good view of the blunted head shape or the tail length, but still just it. Uh, sorry, I, I guess I geek out too much on on rats. Uh, it's not advancing slides for me. OK, there we go. OK, Norway rats, they're originally from northern Mongolia. Uh, then they got into China, which they most likely traveled the Silk Road where people were they were caravans going across Asia. And this was during the Middle Ages and they were transporting goods and different things. Silk being the primary thing tra uh, being transported as well, as spices and such. Well, they also traveled with rats. Uh, these rats, they're, they're world conquerors, Norway rats. You got to have some respect for these guys, okay? They've, they're, they're now successfully living on six of seven continents, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, found in all 50 states. Uh, they're just extreme survivors. Uh, tons of common names for them. People say wharf rat, sewer rat, uh, brown rat. Uh, these are the guys, if you live in New Orleans, these are the rats you're seeing in the French Quarter. Uh in New Orleans, we have both species. We have Radish ratus and Radish norviticus, and you're going to see uh, typically when you look up at the power lines at night, if you're uptown in that area and you see those rats running on the power lines, those are going to be uh, Radish ratus. When you're in the French Quarter and you see the rat running on the ground in filth, uh, that's going to be your Radish norviticus. Uh, I love people say, oh my God, the rats in a French Quarter, they're as big as cats. Uh, that's a total myth. Rats don't get as big as cats. Uh, these guys at most get to be about a pound. Uh, the current record actually in America is 22 ounces and that was in Maryland. Uh, but that's an abnormality. These guys generally don't live long enough to get that big to begin with. Uh, but given enough food and lack of predators, they, they can get up to a, about a pound. Like I said, the average rat we take in is about 12 ounces actually. But how do they look that big? Uh, they posture, they get their dander up. If you've ever seen a cat or a dog uh, get into an aggressive uh, situation, they tend to uh, put their fur on end and put their legs out a little bit to try and make themselves look bigger. Uh, rats are really good at doing this, but uh, I assure you, uh, a rat bigger than uh, or as big as a dog, we, we call those neutrists. They, they do exist, but you're not going to see them in a French Quarter uh, or anywhere in the, in the city proper. You'd have to go to the outskirts, and that's a whole other uh, topic. But uh, these guys are generally a brownish gray color, uh, sometimes with a little bit of a reddish tint to them too. Uh, they, uh, they're gonna have a, a very typical, the white belly on them. And I know everyone's seen the typical white research rat or the fancy hooded rats that they sell at pet stores and such. Uh, those guys don't make it in nature. Those variations do occur sometimes, but 
Uh, those are the animals that are first picked off by predators. I'd say the most common variation you're going to see in this is jet black. Uh, in the French Quarter, we come across about a dozen or so jet blacks a year. Uh, they're really, really cool. Uh, but, I mean, at, like I said, they have a, a better advantage. You'd think you'd see more, but you really don't. Uh, they have a blunt nose. When you look at these guys in the head, too, the, their head shape is made for digging. They're like little mini bulldozers. They're stocky little rats with blunt noses like that, and their ears are on the side, and they actually set backwards when they go to dig. The ears uh, hit flat against the head. Uh, that's to keep dirt and other particulates from getting in there. Uh, and the tail on these guys is significantly shorter than the, the body and the head combined. See, in this picture, you get a good view for what we're talking about with that head shape, and you also see that the tail is nowhere near uh, as long as the head and the body. It usually ends between the ears and the eyes, the tail length on these guys. Uh, like all the other rodents that we're going to talk about, uh, they are big-time producers. Uh, litter size depends on availability of resources, though. So uh, let's say right now, currently, we're seeing almost no pups at all. Uh, this is probably due to the fact that there's so much less food and the populations are so stressed that they're just not they're either not producing as many pups or they're passing up on this breeding season. Uh, their pups are born blind and naked. Uh, they takes uh, about 14 days. So they're actually uh, eyes are open and they're up and crawling around. It takes about a month until they're actually out and on their own adventuring into the world where we start seeing them. If you're finding blind naked pups crawling around, you are uh, you're on top of your rat nest. OK, you your problem is right next to you. It's easy to find. Uh, and occasionally you will find a pup like this because like dogs and cats, the rats will, if she had a nest in some spot where, uh, she became endangered or, or the nest was disturbed, she will move her pups. Uh, cause we found that plenty of times where you'll find a random pup on the sidewalk or something. And that's, that's probably how that occurred. Okay. Uh, uh, really quick. They hit sexual reproduction age where they are able to make more rats, uh, once again, just like the number of pups, this is going to be based on the abundance of resources. Uh, peak breeding is spring and fall, but depending on what part of the country you're in, you could get more breeding seasons than this. Uh, we, we normally experience four here down South Louisiana and New Orleans. Uh, up in New York for Norway, they only get two. Uh, you know, climate change right now is going to play a big role in these animals uh, as far as what they're doing for breeding and things like that. I think it, it's really going to change things uh, and probably make it so that they're putting out more litters from the looks of things. Uh, they don't live long in the wild at all. Uh, if you look at the picture at the bottom, it's hard to tell from this far out, but uh, that wasn't a predator that took out this rat, actually. It was another rat. Uh, this was a COVID picture of a rat that's fed on by another rat. Uh, it's pretty blue out there. It's become a ratty rat world now that there's a lot less garbage out there for them to, to feed upon. Uh, Norway rats are very social. Uh, they live in large colonies. Uh, you can have, you know, as few as a dozen or so rats to as many as, you know, 50, 60 plus even greater numbers sometimes. I've seen a colony that had hundreds of rats one time. Uh, the, to say that they're all living together in unison, that's a bit far, but they definitely act, uh, they definitely have some teamwork occurring. Moms will take turns uh, uh, feeding each other's pups. So the other mom can go out and get water and get food. Uh, they all live in these underground burrow systems where they share sleeping areas. There's latrines uh, that are shared. Uh, they'll have a little hoard of food, a little pantry area where they share food too that they drag back to the burrows uh, with them. Or um, that way, you know, moms don't have to travel as far to go find food. Uh, so they are pretty social for rodents. Uh, you don't see that too much in house mice at all. It's it's very different dynamic and. When we get to roof rats, we'll talk about how they do things very different, too. Uh, but these guys are awesome diggers. So uh, fresh soil, that's a good spot to start looking. If you put a flower bed or a vegetable garden outside and you want to know where your rats are living, that's a good spot to start checking. Uh, they love to burrow around the edges of buildings, too, because it gives extra stability to the burrow system. So look in your corners and along your walls. Uh, that's good, a good place to look for them. Uh, you're going to notice if you if you do find it, there's this uh, very typical doming that occurs when they 
uh, of the soil when they're uh, tunneling underneath it. It's all that extra soil gets pushed up and they pile it up on top. So once you see it and learn to recognize it, you won't be able to mistake it. Okay, uh, the factors in rat success is they're, they don't mind being crowded together. They, uh, Norway's especially, they love being uh, close together and they love uh, these tight areas because it gives them this feeling of safety to be in tight spaces. Uh, and the fact that they eat almost everything, uh, or at least they'll try to eat just about everything. Uh, and people don't take that into account. They always go, why do I have rats? Why are rats in my neighborhood? Uh, we don't, you know, we keep our yard clean. Well, look at it from a bigger picture. Uh, it's not just your yard, it's your neighbor's yard. It's the yard down the block because these guys have large territories and uh, home ranges that uh, mean they're able to go out and, and find food and other things. We're gonna, in a second, we're gonna get into uh, territories and home range. Yeah, versatility of feeding is definitely one of the keys to success for these animals. Uh, and when you eliminate one food source, they will swap quick to another one. Now, especially uh, natural food sources that we overlook are one of the big issues that you're going to see. Because cities, we love to do this in cities. We love to uh, do landscaping that looks beautiful and don't consider the fact that some of these plants produce fruits and nuts certain times of the year that actually draw in animals. Uh, so... It's about looking for you. We have to look forward more when we're planning out things and think it through. I know rats often get uh, overlooked because they're so small. Uh, it will not advance the slide for me. There we go. Okay. Uh, peak feeding. These guys go out at dusk and dawn, like we uh, like I said in the intro picture, seeing daylight behind that full-grown adult rat. That's a, an odd thing to see, but it's not unheard of. I'll give a good example. Uh, in Jackson Square, at one point, we had a rodent issue, and we've since taken care of it. Uh, but part of it linked to the trash cans in the park and when they were being emptied. And when we changed up the schedule to empty the trash cans every day at sunset, the rats figured out they no longer had a food source at night anymore. So Guess what? The rats started coming out during the day when they to try and find trash when there's still trash in the trash can. So, you know, they will adapt to that. Uh, also, let's say a uh, busy business or something. Uh, it's open till two or three in the morning. The rats will adapt and they won't become active until the business shuts down. You go and uh, look at a business like that and wait till about a half an hour after they close and look in the windows. And that's when you'll see your rodent activity start to occur. You know, they they'll learn to adapt to our schedules now. Uh, I should have started with this. The key to road control in general is sanitation. Uh, so if you clean up, you, we can starve these animals out. Natural food sources take into account. It is easy to at least keep their numbers at a more than manageable uh, thing. We just have to learn to clean up more because uh, Norway rats, they want an ounce of food per day. They can survive off less, but to be happy and healthy and producing at peak levels and living, hap uh, you know, living the way they want, that's an ounce of food. An ounce of food is a good bit of food. You know, that's a, like a fistful of food a day. So if we can learn to limit this, they'll go looking for food somewhere else eventually, or they'll go to our bait stations with rodenticides, or they'll go to our snap traps uh, more often. Uh, but like I said, that is one of the problems. They are really good at adapting and finding new food sources once you clean one up. I like our list of things they eat, uh, insects, mammals, birds, reptiles. Yeah, they'll they're cannibalistic. Uh, they'll go eat American cockroaches and other insects. Uh, earthworms, when they're digging their burrows, they love earthworms, not only rats. Uh, birds, you want to find a park that has a rodent problem, go up, uh, go to a park, and if there are no pigeons, that's a pretty good sign that there's a rodent problem occurring because pigeons are, are clever enough to figure out when they're being hunted, and they'll stop going to those parks if the rats are hunting them there. Uh, reptiles will eat small lizards and frogs and such if they can get their little, if they can get their little teeth on it to, they'll eat it. But the last thing of, of importance here is going to be the free clean water. Uh, if they're really desperate, they'll drink dirty water, but they will fight to get clean water. Uh, if they're in a building, they'll chew through copper pipes to get the clean the, to get clean water. Uh, house mice will drink some of the most stagnant, foul water and not care, or they'll get a majority of their moisture from their food. But Norway's and roof rats both are going to know they want fresh water. Uh, that is one of the things they will go nuts in a building if they can't get. They will just start tearing pipes apart.
Okay. Uh, they can, uh, Norwood rats can have very large home ranges up to a, a thousand square feet or more sometimes, but their territories are going to be smaller. The home range is where they go out every night and they look for food. Uh, they, they might go around and do some exploring here and there, look for a spot if they need to move, you know, a secondary home. But the territory, that's going to be the important spot. That's the spot where they, where they nest at, where you're going to find your most rodent signs. Uh, Things to look for for it, look for a constant water source for sure, okay? Because rats, they, they want the easy button all the time. Uh, if they can get their food, water, and shelter all in one little tiny area, they'll do it. But if they have to travel, they're not afraid to expand it. Uh, we noticed from years of, of observations that a majority of our rats in the French Quarter, when it gets dry and we don't have rain, they're all traveling to the river to drink, and they do it via the storm drain system. So, uh, you know, these animals have figured out where it goes and, they, it's a long way via pipes, even a long way via foot from the river to uh, a lot of the areas where these animals' home ranges are. So they're traveling a long way just to drink. A lot of times, some of them will move closer to their water source or their food source. Like I said, they, they want everything convenient, but they will adapt if it's inconvenient. Uh, Okay, just a little uh, rough drawing of a burrow system. Like I said, this is very basic, the three holes, entry, exit, and bolt hole. The bolt holes, they, they're very good at camouflaging them. They'll drag, drag in garbage from the street, napkins, uh, paper cups, things like that. Sometimes it's leaves and other debris from the ground, ground clutter. Uh, but Norway's are really good at hiding it. And like I said, this is a very basic drawing of a burrow system. Uh, we know now that there's uh, often more chambers to it. But we also know that they can be a lot more entries and exits. Sometimes they'll they'll dig burrows that don't go anywhere. It's just a temporary little hiding spot, or maybe they ran into something that made them quit digging. We're not quite sure, but uh, they don't always go somewhere. So that's something too. Oh, this is such a great picture, and it tells a great story, which I will do my best to tell. And, and uh, there is a video of this on YouTube that's not ours though. So if you want to go looking, it's. Uh, it's easy enough to find it, but this situation, this is from years ago, and I'm happy to say I went back there about uh, before COVID happened, so about nine months ago or so, uh, and this was fixed. This went away, but all those holes in there, those are rodent burrows, and uh, you could go out there during the day at one o'clock in the afternoon and see 50, 60 rats, sometimes more, running around and being rats, playing, foraging not caring at all. And this was because they had so many rodents in this area. Uh, they had to adapt like this. They, they were working in shifts where, you know, they had a night shift and a day shift of rodents, all the young, uh, subservient ju junior league rats there, they were pushed out to daytime. And that's when they had the only time they had to forge. Cause that night when all the adults came out, they were just overpowered and pushed away. Uh, but there was a fast food restaurant, a department store, a large drainage canal and this was enough to get this going but it really pushed this over the edge to be such a monumental issue and this is just a snapshot this colony actually extended a hundred yards down this canal bank uh like i said the, you, if you sit and count burrows here it wouldn't surprise me if, if you got 20 plus easy just in this one picture well continue that going a hundred yards but what really was the the straw that broke the camel's back here was there was a feral cat colony and someone was dumping food out. And uh, every time they dumped food out in the evenings, the cats wouldn't get a chance to eat. The rats would swarm the bags. So you had a constant water source from the canal, uh, constant food from the dumpster from the fast food restaurant and the department store's dumpster, plus uh, a cat food dumped every day, a great big 30 pound bag of protein rich cat food. So, yeah, you get population explosions like this. It's about figuring out everything and limiting it. Uh, I, I talked to the people who fixed this problem, and it was about uh, securing getting rodent-proof dumpsters for both the, the fast food restaurant and an apartment store, and about getting with the feral cat feeder and explaining to them, look, let's relocate this cat colony. So sometimes it takes a little more effort, but it did take, it was fixed eventually. Okay, the roof rat, radish radis. Uh, these guys get such a bum rap. Uh, I feel so bad for them. They get black plague blamed on them. 
when really everybody knows or, or most people know it was either the fleas or the lice on the rats that were tra- carrying the disease and not the rat itself. But they're world travelers as well. But these guys, uh, while Norway's are from Mongolia, uh, these guys are from actually Southeast Asia. I think Vietnam, Laos area. Uh, they were jungle rats. They were very slick and learned to climb trees and uh, walk ledges and vines. And they, they're they very acrobatic animals, uh, very nimble. But uh, they're they too. They're not uh, they're not across all fifty states though. You're only going to find these guys in our warmer in our warmer states because that they were jungle rats. They were tropical rats, and they pretty much stayed that way. But like I said earlier, with climate change, it's affecting. Uh, these guys are being found now in areas where they shouldn't be, or traditionally they were never found. So if you're in a state or an area where you're not supposed to find roof rats and you find them, please uh, send us your information. Uh, that's definitely something we'd like to know because uh, it'd be cool to mark and follow them as they're going further and further north as average temperatures are warming. Um, I can't imagine the nightmare this will be when it gets to some cities because these guys are tough to handle sometimes. Uh, you know, aren't these some great pictures? But they're smaller and sleeker than a Norway rat. Uh, they usually top out at about 12 ounces, but the ones we catch generally are about 8, 9 ounces. Uh, of course, gray to black solid uh gray to black fur uh but that's that is definitely uh, a standard when you say the gray to black fur but it can change different night and day uh we did this study with tulane a few years ago where we were trapping roof rats and we noticed neighborhood to neighborhood color differences sometimes we would call it beautiful gold rats uh we caught some silvers uh i mean the variations were really noticeable and they were just amazingly beautiful animals uh you can see in the pictures though how large that ear is when you take the ear and flop it down, it'll go past the eye, actually, and go all the way down to the jaw on it. When you do that with a Norway, the, the ear's going to end right at the eye. Uh, and when you take the tail and pull it forward on that roof rat, you see it goes a good inch beyond, uh, inch plus beyond the head and the, and the body combined. Uh, now, oh, I forgot to mention, you're doing this on dead animals, okay? Don't do this to live animals or they will bite you. Uh, it would not be pleasant at all. Uh, Aren't those pretty though? My cat, I got to give her credit to my cat brought me these, this, this rat to take photos of. So thank you, Callie. Oh, cool. We get a video. We're going to get to watch some juvenile roof rats uh, feeding. And you guys will get a good view of what they look like uh, and a little bit behavior. Uh, pause the video. Here we go. Aren't they cute? See those big ears? Notice it's it, even that there's some bit of teamwork. You're, you're getting to see a little bit of the behavioral dynamic as far as how they act in a group versus uh, how the Norways act in a group. Oh, I thought I had one more slide showing family dynamic, but uh, just a brief bit on roof rats family. They live in family pods generally. It's going to be mom, dad, and the pups for that season. And once the pups are old enough, they kick them out and they start over again. That's not saying that you don't find gigantic roof rat infestations. There's areas where I've been where there were hundreds, if not thousands of roof rats living in, in really close quarters with each other. But that being said, uh, they had very small home ranges. Everything was provided where they get food and water easily, and they were tolerating the other animals living next to them pretty much. But if one mom went and found the pups of another mom, a Norway would have sat and t- taken care of the other pups as if they were her own. The roof rat is going to kill the other pups because she's only worried about her own pups. And uh, we're not going to get that deep into behavior on this presentation, though, so we're going to jump to inspections and what we're looking for on our rodent inspections. Uh, these are some cool pictures too. Yeah. Uh, if anybody's wondering about the pipe up there, that's sebum on the pipe, which we're going to discuss exactly what that is. But uh, that's another cool picture. I didn't notice earlier that it was in here. Uh, first thing we're going to look for are droppings. Uh, rodents, for a long time we taught, and we were learning more and more about these guys every day, every year. Uh, but we taught that it was random, that these animals were defecating and urinating randomly because they did it so frequently, we assumed it had to be random. Well, we're finding out more and more we were wrong. They use, as Chloe said, they use pheromones to communicate, and house mice tend to use urine more to communicate. Uh, rats tend to use droppings more to communicate. 
but they're putting little pheromone markers and messages in their urine and droppings. Uh, they're also putting uh, horrible pathogens in them. So that's another two reasons to clean them, clean up the droppings in urine, uh, disease issues, and also what they're telling each other. Because sometimes those messages in there could say, "Hey guys, food over here. This is a safe feeding spot." Uh, you know, "Hey, uh, water's over here, everybody." So, you know, definitely clean them up. As far as identification for each goes, oh, I thought. Uh, I guess I'll hold off on that for just a second. Uh, let's watch this video of a rat doing its thing and show you how not random it is. There's our rat pooping. Now, you say, how How do you know it's not random? Well, uh, it's tough to say, but I know it's not because it's not running as it's doing it. It's not just dropping it. And what it's saying, I don't know. Honestly, we have a long way to go on figuring out what they're saying in these little pheromone messages, but we know it's saying something to, to the other rats. Let me go one more time. Okay, as far as identification of droppings goes, the house mouse dropping, the best comparison I can think of would be uh, average house mouse droppings about a grain of rice. And I'm using a grain of rice. Of course, they're not going to be white unless they're eating candles or eating white food. Uh, because rodent droppings are affected by their diet, so they can be different colors, such uh, such as when they eat rodenticides, the, the dying of rodenticide will dye the droppings. Uh, but the house mouse uh, dropping, just like a grain of rice, has pointed ends on it. That's going to be one of your key features, because a lot of times people misidentify house mouse droppings and American cockroach droppings. And if you want to know the difference easy, the house mouse dropping is going to have points on the end. The American cockroach dropping is going to have a cut blunt, uh, flat end on it. it's not going to have points so think of a black grain of rice and if you find black grains of rice in your bag of rice throw it away okay uh our roof rat droppings uh like i said color is not a good way to identify droppings these are that color because the animal's eating something that was tan or uh opaque uh before it had to do its business uh, the thing we're looking for on these droppings is they're long, slender, and of course with that point. But you also notice how some of these have a distinctive hook on them. Uh, that's one of your identifying features on these guys as well is going to be that little hook to it. Sometimes it's much more dramatic, almost banana shaped or crescent like a moon, uh, like a crescent moon shape. But sometimes it's less predominant. Uh, Norway rat droppings. Uh, think raisins, guys. Uh, hairy raisins, because if you see what the arrow is pointing at, it's pointing out a little hair on the end. Now, uh, these can vary in size from, like I said, raisin size to I found one recently that was almost the size of my pinky. Uh, so that came from a very large rat. I don't think it came from one as big as a dog. I just think uh, it came from a great big Norway rat. Uh, as far as tracks go, uh, you're going to have four. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, gee, that was wrong. You're going to have four on the front and five on the back. Uh, that's an identifying feature in rodents where they're all going to have four toes on the front and five on the back. Uh, I love that picture because it, it, people, we overlook the details uh, and we overlook the little things people do that all the time. And I wonder how many times until I got into rats that I overlooked rat tracks and how many times a day other people just go by and overlook rat tracks. Because uh, they're all over the place when you stop and actually start looking for them, which we're going to talk about how to find them. Uh, oh, here's a nice illustration of that four and five. That's one of our little mice, our little movie star mice that we're making videos and uh, pictures with right now. Okay, guys, dust, uh, especially for the homeowners. This is a great one because if you want to look for rodents in your house, guys, go into your attic, go in your garage, your dusty areas of the of these places, and you're going to find if they're if they've been there, you should find their tracks pretty easily. Uh, you can see on the left hand picture. Uh, that tray right there, that round tray, that's rat tracks on there. And this picture was taken from a good distance, but you can already easily make out the tracks on the tray. You can almost pick out each toe. Uh, you can see where the tail drug uh, behind the animal as it walked across this tray. Uh, on the right-hand picture, you're going to see uh, that dust with those little dots. That's mouse tracks. My, mouse tracks are not easy to find. I might have a dozen or so pictures that are decent of mouse tracks where you go, oh, wow, that's a track. Uh, but this was awesome because it was also you get those tail drags and you can see how frequently this animal travels this path. You also see how they travel. They'll scurry a little bit and maybe they heard something and they smell something when they get to that spot. Uh, so they stop. Uh, 
So I love how the dust shows you how often this animal is coming back and forth and traveling that way. Uh, but these are things we can find in our house. You know, like I said, we can go up to our attics where they, there are years and years of dust, take a flashlight and shine and look for spots where the dust is missing. Uh, these animals leave us these little clues and it's up to us to find them all. Uh, another typical thing, if you're wondering if the rats are getting in your trash can, go and look. Because a lot of times you look in your trash can and you see rips and tears and you assume it's where something you threw into the garbage snagged the trash bag, right? That makes perfect sense. But when you look a little closer, see on the right, we can see the little marks. But when we bend over and look into the trash can and take a good look, you start seeing there's a pattern to them. Those are actually claw marks. You can start counting it out and, and tell that a rodent's been going in and out of the trash can or worse the rodents in the trash can. Uh, and if you look at the top of the picture right here uh, on that left side, you can see a track where he's already, or you see a tear where he's already tr attempted to get out the can. And the funny thing is a lot of times these animals could easily go out the bottom of the can. I, I have no idea why they choose, why they prefer to go in and out the tops of trash cans, but, and you're going to see eventually some pictures where they definitely will have no problem going through the bottoms. But uh, it's funny in this one area, they were uh, where I got this picture from. They they had a habit of going out the tops of cans instead of chewing out the bottoms. It was really weird. Uh, other things, gnaw damage. OK, uh, they love to chew things. Uh, and it's not so much uh, that uh, I believe Claudia did mention that they're not trying to file their teeth down. They're exploring their world. Their mouth is their world. So they go around and they they sample stuff here and there to see, can I eat this? Can I eat that? Or sometimes they're looking for uh, nesting material. So they go, hey, can I shred this? So let's say he's chewing a wire. Think of it, uh, if this rat was out in, in the jungles where he's from, he's not seeing the wire as a wire. He's seeing the wire as a vine. And hey, maybe I can make my nest out of this out of this vine, so I'm going to chew it. Uh, but them gnawing wires causes unknown amounts, uh, large, vast amounts, actually, of fires across the world. But we don't have a steady number on it because... It's really hard to determine if it's the rodents that cause it or not, but it's not far-fetched at all to believe they cause gr a great number of fires. Okay, if you get really good and you want to get really scientific with it, guys, you can actually measure and tell what species was chewing what uh, within reason. Uh, roof rats in Norway are, are really tough. It's not impossible, but you can tell house mouse versus uh, Norway and roof rat easily. It's two millimeters is going to be the incisor mark left behind behind a when a house mouse bites something. So these chocolate bars, oh, these chocolate bars were in a vending machine, open to the public. Uh, and while we were inspecting and looking at this, people were coming and spending money and getting candy out of the machine. Uh, one or two people even commented that they were aware that mice were feeding in the machine and they were, they were taking a gamble. They were hungry. They wanted a candy bar. Maybe they'd get lucky and get a bar that wasn't chewed on yet. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's life in the rat world and dealing with stuff. Uh, but guys, it's easy enough to measure these and be able to identify what animal we're dealing with. Uh, as I said, see this perfect example of a rat chewing through the bottom of a trash can. They don't have to go through the tops of them. These guys, uh, obviously, do you think a house mouse did this? No, no. Uh, obviously, a, a rat did this. And it was almost definitely a Norway rat. While I didn't get down on hands and knees and measure it, uh, there were other things that led me to know it was Nori rats. But look, look what was in the trash can waiting for this guy. Uh, he had a whole buffet. He's got half-eaten bag of chips. He's got some McDonald's. He's got all kinds of just great, wonderful garbage waiting for them when they come in. And we're not going to pay attention to this. This is one of those things where uh, going the extra mile helps. Getting the rodent-proof trash can, the rodent-resistant trash can. But it's things that we overlook all the time because whoever looks at the bottom of their trash can to see if a rat chewed through it. Uh, other than me. Uh, like I said, we can measure it easily. Uh, isn't that a great picture? Four millimeters for uh, for Norway rats. It's going to be about four millimeters for a roof rat too, a little less. But like I said, it's very hard to measure the difference on these guys. But it's so distinct when you see the damage. And they're chewing through. That's a trash can. They chewed through. And they didn't go through the bottom of this one either. They went through the side of this one. Don't know why they picked going through the side, but they did. Actually, uh, some investigation that showed us what happened. The rat got trapped inside. If you look really close, he's chewing out from the inside. He didn't chew from the outside. 
he was able to go through the top and he got trapped in the trash can. So he chewed his way from the outside or from the inside out. That is just, that is wonderful. Uh, here's some radish radish. How do I know radish radish did this? Uh, because we had a ton of radish radish droppings all around uh, this damage. Uh, this was really cool. You guys don't know it, but that, that's a bait bucket. He was chewing to get to Redenicide. This rat chewed to his own death. So uh, it's kind of neat. Okay, looking for burrows. Uh, a lot of times, uh, like I said, they go against the side of buildings and sidewalks to get that extra stability. Uh, and, it, you know, these guys can be lazy too. They don't want to have to dig that much. That's one less chance of their burrow collapsing. Uh, a lot of times too, these burrows can lead to spots where they're getting access into buildings sometimes. So that can be an issue as well. Okay, runways. This is so cool uh, when you think about it like this. Okay, we talked about earlier how much these weigh, and Norway's made these runways, Norway rats. So, and look at how worn the grass is in that area. So an animal that weighs less than a pound, okay, about 12 ounces or so, made runs like that. He didn't make it himself. Him and all his buddies made it, running back and forth to that trash can every night. But think about how many multiple trips it takes to wear away grass at that level. That's just staggering, okay, because... Man, that, that that just blows me away how active these animals can be. Uh, but the thing this is, is telling us, this is giving us a bullseye of what we need to do, right? We can see the trail the animal's taking, so we know where his primary food source is. Let's eliminate it. Or we could put a bait station in that run. We could put a snap trap in that run. Uh, we could put a glue board in that run. Uh, there are so many options because the animal's telling us exactly where he travels every night. And on these runs, they drop, they put droppings and they put urine and they put these scent markers so that these animals will run these trails so quickly that they forget all, you know, they just, they're hardwired to do it. They forget that they're, that they should be taking their time and they run through. So it's easier to catch them in traps like that. Uh, it's easier to catch them off guard when they run that same path every day. Uh, also, when we follow the trails back, we not only find our food source, we find their burrows. So if you're having trouble finding where they're eating at and where they're living at, follow those trails back when you can find them. If you look close at the picture on the right, you can actually see their droppings in there too, right at the entry to the burrow. Uh, and it's just so clear cut through the vegetation. The animal is giving us a blueprint of where to place our devices to control it. Oh, and they also come out every day and they manicure those trails a lot. So if you look really close, you'll see uh, marks where they go and trim all the vegetation back so they can keep the path clear. Oh, and we do get a close-up of this awesome pipe picture from earlier. Uh, I just love it because that, that's so much sebum on there and so much urine and droppings just over years on that one pipe. It's telling me where to put my snap trap at because those animals come across it. You can zip tie a trap to that and catch the animal really quick. Uh, but they also have pheromones in these rub marks. So they have all these inform all this information in there that's telling them, like I said earlier, where to eat, where to drink, come over here, uh, you know, stay away from there. But these things have to be cleaned up too. Uh, they have to be wiped down to, to get that pheromone marker off. Uh, really cool things about rub marks over time. If you look at the upper left picture, you see the rub mark at the base of things. And if you look really close, you can see a snap trap in the far right corner of that picture. Uh, the technician who put this trap out came so close but yet missed. He was never going to catch the rat because the rat wasn't going back there. The rat was going, and he told us exactly where to put the trap at because we can see how the rub in, the, in that upper left picture extends. So the animal's not only rubbing it, he's rubbing and turning. So put your trap there when, he t when the animal tells you. And if you look at the upper right picture, you can see I carved my initials into, uh, into that rat wax there, that sebum. Uh, which, as I said earlier, uh, sebum is this oil that all mammals put out, uh, but rats put out a ton of it. Uh, so we're using that to our advantage. I carved my initials in it so I can see I can come back the next day, and if it's covered and I can't see my initials anymore after a day or two, I know that I haven't caught the rats, so the rats are still traveling that path because it filled it in, because that rat's going to put out so much sebum being covered in a day or two. The downside of this is now they know my initials and they know who I am, and I think they're plotting against me. But uh, if you look at the bottom picture, you get to see some of that dander and some of you can almost see the greasy oiliness of that uh, on that uh, rat there. Oh, great pictures of rub marks. Like I said, telling us exactly where to put traps at to catch them. 
Uh, the picture on the left, you see that rub coming off that beam or that animal shimming it down. You wouldn't imagine that it'd be able to go up and down that pipe right there on that wall, but it can go up and down like a little bolt of lightning there, so quick on those. Uh, we look on the picture on the right-hand side, and we can see where the animal comes down the conduit and sits at that light switch and then shimmies down that beam right there and then jumps down to, uh, to the floor area. It's telling us where to put our devices at, you know? Uh, but, man, that's just so awesome. You just got to look for the little clues. Okay, urine stains. Uh, there's a trick with UV light. We're not going to discuss it because that takes years of practice, but sometimes they make it obvious, guys. Uh, this was one of those cases. That is urine from years and years of those rats running that area and marking. You know, they were showing something important to each other. The really funny kind of neat thing is if you're in the pest control and you, you notice a shape of the urine trail. Uh, it's very distinctive. It's almost the shape of a bait station because it was. There was a bait station with redenticide and it placed against the wall. And the rats were running around it. They never, ever interacted with the station in years because, you know, why would they? They were hardwired to run that one path. If the technician were to move the station over three or four inches and align the entry with that urine path, he'd have probably hit the animals in the first night. So it's, like I said, detective work, looking uh, looking and using the, the animal's biology and the hints they gave us with it to their disadvantage and to our advantage. Uh, other rodent signs, live and dead rodents, guys. I know it sounds obvious, but people overlook this, okay? If you see a dead rodent, that's a pretty good sign you have a rodent issue in your area. If you see a live rodent, it might mean you have an issue. It might mean that you have a guy who's exploring his territory, but it definitely means you should start paying attention. If I saw a rat in my backyard, I would start looking at my backyard and going, do I have anything drawing these animals in? Do I have buckets of water out they could be coming to drink from? Do I have a leaky faucet? Uh, did I have a vegetable garden this year, and did I leave any vegetables growing? Is there a fruit tree or a nut tree somewhere in my yard that I can do anything about where I can remove the excess fruit and nuts from it? Are my garbage cans secure? Uh, things like this. I would start looking at my property first and then start looking outward. Because a lot of times people have the bad habit of blaming the vacant property next door or the overgrown property next door. And the thing is, as we said earlier, these animals need a significant amount of food every day to live. So without that constant food source, while they are versatile, you can't sustain large numbers of them in a vacant property unless there's a large amount of food at that property. So odds are they could be just traveling through the property or they might be sheltering in it. But something nearby is actually providing the food beyond that. So, like I said, sanitation, find, find and clean up what that food source is, and these rodents will go away on their own or take care of themselves or make it easier for us to take care of them. And I'm going to turn over control back to Claudia now. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you, Timmy. I appreciate it. I apologize about my speaker, so we're going to get that resolved on the next one. But... Um, so this is just a summary slide, but you know, everything we've talked about today, Timmy and myself, you know, these animals are incredibly complex. I mean, they are mammals, um, you know, their sensory, uh, the way they communicate is, is very sophisticated. And uh, clearly these are, are paradomestic. So they're living in and around us and that's in their, our yards, properties around our properties, of course, and then also inside. And you know, for us, you know, what we're trying to get across is that you really have to understand what species that you're dealing with of rodent, as well as understanding their biology and their habits so that we can do a better job of, of managing and also give you the tools um, so that you have a better understanding of the role that we all play in keeping them stressed. I mean, that is ultimately what we want to do. Um, if you're interested in this uh, brochure, it is on our website. You're able to grab it, um, disseminate it, use it as you will. So the series, at least with rodents, are going to build. And our next topic that we're going to have is integrated pest management. And we're going to teach everybody how to keep these animals stressed. And it's about the food, it's about the water, and it's about where they live. So I always say what you want to do in this triangle, IPM triangle, is cut two legs. And if you do that, it provides so much stress on these animals 
that that population is going to decrease. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Astasia and she'll be able to handle questions. Okay, good morning again or good afternoon. I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anyone have any questions right now for either Dr. Regal or Timmy? All right. Wait, then we do have a question. I'm trying oh, right. to. Mr. Richard, you can ask your question if you can unmute yourself. It's not letting me unmute you. Hello? Good morning or good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so um, w one of the places that I, I manage is a, a fogplex. It has a slab. And as we know, with the subsidence, it tends to be uh, a vacant spot under the slab. And what people do throughout our region is bring, bring in fill and they fill uh, around. So, you know, people don't even often think about that big vacant spot underneath. And some of, uh, of the slides that were shown showed a hole next to slabs. So, all they need is, is a little hole, and there's this massive space under the structure, including pipes and such, sewer pipes, perhaps as a, a, bro a break in the pipe. But I'm just thinking that that's a, a huge amount of space. Uh, in this place where I live in Metairie, most of the houses are in slabs, and I'm sure most of them probably have six inches to a foot of space underneath, yet they're filled, but all the rodents need is one little access and it sounds like they got a city you know a major area to live in and uh, that that's my comment hey richard so nice to see you on the call um so happy to hear from you i'm glad you're doing well um so this is claudia so you know with the subsidence that we have uh, honestly that's a, a bigger issue for termites uh, in termite control right because you're breaking that barrier for termites uh, but yeah, I mean, people do fill it, uh, backfill, which is good. But, you know, rats are not going to necessarily burrow and create their, their network of, um, of burrows there. Uh, however, um, other animals, such as raccoons or possums or think something like that, may be hanging out in that space. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think anybody who's got a slab property should be constantly walking around. You know, we always suggest for mosquito control once a week, um, and that can just be a, a, a general pest check. Um, so definitely look to see if burrows, um, you know, are dug into that area. So I don't know if Timmy wants to make any more comments on that. Well, I, I saw a, uh, well, for about a I think a possum died. I see a lot of possums, and I think a possum died under the slab because for about six weeks, I could I could smell, you know, a dead animal. Apparently, uh, and it was a little crack, and it just kept coming up. It was probably a possum. Yeah, you know, the the subsidence is something that really needs to be addressed, and especially, you know, when you're thinking about it from termites, make sure that that sand is treated, you know, get with your pest control company and make sure that that uh, barrier of that termiticide is, is replaced. Um, and of course, if you've got baiting systems, that's less of an issue, um, but very important to do it correctly. An another uh, side to this, I remember seeing pictures in New York City of rats coming up and swimming right through the toilets. You know, they, they come up through the pipes. Apparently there's an opening in the pipe so they can, go up through the building and then enter an apartment through the toilets. Is, is that is that something that's happening around here? And is that actually real? Do they actually uh, do that? Timmy, you want to take that one? Do you want me to take it? Yes, it's definitely real. Uh, we have some video actually uh, of a rat entering a pipe that it used to get into a toilet in a building in the city. 
Uh, it does happen. It's when you're missing. Uh, there's a cap that goes on the plumbing, and if that cap is missing, the rodent has no problem going in and swimming up. It can hold its breath and maneuver its way through easily. It doesn't happen every day, but it does happen. Uh, and it's not a New York thing. That's a worldwide thing. Those guys will do it any chance they see an open pipe. Uh, well, well, and of course, with the subsidence in, in the age of a lot of buildings and the, uh, the cast iron pipes, there's a lot of uh, broken <laughs> sewer pipes under houses yep. Yep, in, in this area. Very important. The other thing is though, that's typically going to happen in an older home, right? So many of the newer homes have that flap. Um, as Timmy was talking about. So that's not as likely to occur um, in our newer homes. But oh. just make sure your plumbing is um, in good condition. Now, now, the flap, are you talking about the toilet flap within the toilet? No, it's part of the plumbing. Okay. Um, it's part of the plumbing system. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for attending today's webinar. Once again, the webinar will be posted on our website. If you live in New Orleans and you have any rodent issues, please call 311 to report them so they can get to us. If you have any other comments, suggestions, or concerns, email us at bugshop at nola.gov. And while we are posting this presentation on our website, we ask that it's only used for educational purposes only. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you all.